Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to what is now the 23rd edition of the Coffee Microcaps Morning Meeting. My name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps for anybody who is joining us for the first time this morning. And just to give you an overview of the event this morning, uh, it's going to be over the next hour. We have two companies presenting. Each company has a 30 minute slot and within that we're going to break it down where we'll have plus minus a 20 minute prezzo and then we're going to have 10 minutes of Q&A at the end. If you do have any questions for the presenters, please type it in the Q&A box rather than in the chat function. It just makes it easier for us to manage the Q&A at the end when we get it. Uh, please note that the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel. So if a presenter does flick over a slide or two too quickly, um, you can go and watch it back. It will be up on the YouTube channel probably by this time tomorrow. Uh, where you can follow Coffee Microcaps, uh, you can follow us on Twitter at C Microcaps. As I said, YouTube for the recording of this webinar and all previous webinars that we've had in the series so far. LinkedIn, where I do some additional long form content. And I also write a weekly paid newsletter, which you can find on the Substack newsletter platform. So first up, we're going to have Dave Clark, the CEO of Selnet Group. Straight after Dave, we've got Grant Hackett, who is the CEO of Generation Development Group. So without further ado, I know I have Dave Clark joining us uh, all the way from Auckland this morning. So Dave, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And if you want to start sharing yours. I can Thanks, see the cover slide of your presentation now, Dave. So you're ready to go. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate that. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining the session. Um, as, as Mark mentioned, my name is Dave Clark. I'm the Chief Executive of uh, Cellnet. Um, I've been with the company for 15 years. Um, prior to my current role, I some 10 years. And, and prior to that, I was with um, Sony in New Zealand for um, 10 years. Uh, on the call with me is um, our Chief financial officer and company secretary, Chris Barnes. Um, he's been with the company for a long period of time as well, for some 15 years. Um, and um, together we'll, um, we'll, we'll be doing the uh, Q&A at the uh, end of the slide. So I've got a, a short presentation that we'll run through um, and um, a bit of an overview of the company and uh, also touching on the um, half year results. So Cellnet was established in 1992, um, so in operation for almost 30 years. Um, we listed in uh, 1999. We're a, a traditionally a, a, a specialist in mobile accessories um, and, and be have become a leader in the um, that space in Australia and New Zealand. Um, so traditionally wholesale distribution um, of lifestyle technology products into channels such as consumer electronics, telcos, um, B2B, SME, um, FMCG, DIY, et cetera. So quite a broad range uh, of um, retail and um, B2B and B2C accounts. Um, we have diversified in recent years. We acquired um, Turnleft Distribution, which is a gaming distributor uh, in 2018. And then in 2019, we had another smaller acquisition into the power space. With a, with a brand called um, PowerGuard, which is now one of our own brands. And in 2020, we completed an acquisition of performance distribution to accelerate our presence in the online space in uh, B2C distri distribution. We have about 70 staff, 50 based in Australia, 20 based in New Zealand, um, with offices in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Auckland, uh, and distribution centers across um, Australia and New Zealand in Auckland, Sydney and Perth with some four smaller facilities in uh, Brisbane and Melbourne. We have market leading brands in the spaces that we play in. Um, many of them are exclusive to us. Uh, and in addition to that, we have our own brands, uh, namely 
360 uh, power guard and wave audio. And these obviously deliver higher margins to us as we do the um, sourcing end-to-end uh, -end, um, into the Australia and New Zealand markets. And that, that function is supported by um, an APAC operation, which is a subsidiary of our um, largest major shareholder, uh, Wintronic, based out of Germany. Um, we have great um, supplier relationships, and these have been um, strengthened more recently, where we are now offering to run the suppliers' uh, websites in, in, the, in the region where we host the website do the, do the content um, uploading, payment gateway and, and shipping for a number of brands in terms of running their own um, uh, dedicated websites uh, under their brand name. So just recapping our first quarter, um, we implemented a strategy in July to uh, turn the business around and we, um, we've worked really hard um, to achieve that. And the, um, uh, the benefit of that was, was seen in our first quarter results. We were up 90% year on year um, for the first quarter, delivering a uh, profit before tax of 551,000 with sales online increasing month on month. And um, working quite hard on our vendor portfolio as well and pivoting towards higher margin um, products and predict, you know, particularly focusing on um, growth segments such as gaming and audio. Um, with a um, improved cost base, and uh, in that first quarter, we saw our costs um, come down 25% year on year. One of the uh, big events for uh, Cellnet um, uh, in October was the launch of the iPhone 12, and uh, all three devices um, were 5G capable. Uh, in addition to the, the benefit that 5G provides in terms of unlocking things like mobile gaming with the speeds it provides, um, the, uh, the, the iPhone 12s no longer came with a wall charger and box, and they um, uh, continue not to be uh, supplied with, with headphones and box either. So that provides a company like us with um, increased demand for aftermarket power and audio products. And in addition, the Mag MagSafe charging system, which the iPhone 12 has, uh, enables a new ecosystem of, of accessories which are compatible um, with, that, um, with that system. So um, that provided us obviously a, um, uh, a, a great um, benefit in terms of our result for October, where we delivered a um, result of um, 12.6 million, which is up 18% year on year. Uh, and a profit of over uh, $1 million uh, PBT. That momentum continued into uh, to November for the iPhone. Uh, and then also in November, we saw the uh, next generation consoles released from both Sony and Microsoft in uh, PS5 and in the Xbox Series X. And uh, while they've been in short supply, it certainly um, you know, carries the momentum for us in terms of that gaming space. And gaming has continued to be a real standout for us um, during the, um, the course of the pandemic with, um, with people obviously being at home more and also working from home and requiring um, headsets um, where um, um, you know, they can use gaming headsets for, for both um, gaming and for, for work. So this um, result has been underscored by the um, execution of our strategy, um, which you know, first and foremost was focusing on fostering and developing a rewarding performance-based culture. Um, I'm a firm believer that culture drives customer experience and that in turn will um, provide the commercial outcomes that, um, that we seek and provide um, return to shareholders. Um, our, our strategy focused around our growth segments um, which have strong underlying demand profiles, such as gaming and audio. Um, we've had a lot of focus on e-commerce uh, and improving our um, fulfillment in that space and um, pivoting our brand portfolio into higher margin brands and brands which um, are, you know, are exclusive to us and focusing on our own brand in that space, which obviously delivers the higher margins as well. Um, and a lot of focus around our inventory control. Uh, in the past, it's been an Achilles heel of, um, of Cellnet and um, we've made a lot of significant improvements in terms of our demand planning um, to ensure our inventory is uh, uh, um, correct and in control. And um, during the course of the 
first half, we've been able to strengthen the balance, balance sheet and extinguish term debt. So the headline for our half year results was, um, it was the strongest um, result for us in 15 years. Um, and as a result of that, we saw the uh, share price increase um, from three cents uh, post our capital raise uh, back in uh, May, 2020 to uh, 16 and a half cents um, on, on the um, uh, 22nd of February. The headline for our results, which we were very proud of, um, strong um, performance in sales, um, first half PBT of 3.4 million, up significantly year on year, up 3.1 uh, million um, on the prior year, um, all term debt fully repaid, cash at bank of um, 4.7 million, and um, cost reduction um, during that um, six month period year on year of over a million dollars. Um, as a result of this, um, we're looking at a return to dividend policy um, and um, uh, we've indicated to the market that um, um, subject to um, any, uh, any uh, downturn in, in second half or other activity in, in M&A um, space, um, we'd be looking at um, um, returning a dividend of around 15% of um, uh, NPAT or higher. Obviously, the, the market didn't react the way we uh, had expected it to off the back of our, um, uh, our announcement. Um, but um, we, um, we, we strongly feel at the moment that the, the company remains a, a solid investment and, and significantly undervalued um, at this point in time. During the, the past six months, the, the press have obviously um, picked up um, on our um, results and the turnaround of the business. Um, and um, I, you know, I've just highlighted on the slide um, some of the, um, the the recent press that um, Selmet has uh, picked up off the back of the um, off the strong results. So what's next? Looking ahead to the second half and the, the next financial year, we're focusing on uh, continued organic growth, uh, namely in uh, in new brands and the online channel. Uh, we are active in the M&A space and um, remain acquisitive. Um, obviously, we ended the, um, the first half with um, um, 4.7 million cash at bank. And um, I've, I've mentioned the capital management opportunities that the, uh, the company is, um, is looking at. One of, the, uh, one of the exciting things for us in the B2C space is um, the launch of Tech Union which is um, a dedicated uh, website where all of our products across mobility, lifestyle technology and gaming is now available. Um, and um, this, uh, this is, uh, has been launched, but it's been a soft launch and the marketing for the site really is only just um, kicking off now. So um, feel free to um, have a look at um, techunion.com.au. And uh, we have a New Zealand domain as well, uh, techunion.co.nz. So it utilizes warehouses across Australia and New Zealand. Um, and um, the Tech Union uh, shop front would, would be expanded across all the major marketplace channels. We've um, spent uh, some investment uh, and time in, in redoing our B2B e-commerce portal for our traditional wholesale uh, distribution uh, partners. And this launch is um, later this month, and um, it's been a, a long time coming. It's been about 10 years since we did a major overhaul of our um, uh, B2B e-commerce uh, portal. And um, I, I'm sure this all would be of immense benefit to our existing and new customer base. We've also uh, just upgraded our um, corporate website. That's had a refresh, so I encourage you to go on and have a look. Um, for, for a period of sort of five years, our, our front door um, had been, you know, left neglected and they hadn't um, had a serious update. So um, the new website's looking very fresh. Um, it has um, an investor area and, um, and will be updated with um, news, news content um, from time to time, etc. cetera. So uh, feel free to um, have a look at our um, new corporate website. So in terms of um, our positioning, we're in a really great space. We're, um, we're covering uh, gaming, uh, traditional console gaming, 
with the likes of um, PlayStation and Xbox. Um, Microsoft is um, tipped to um, release its Game Pass um, this year, which essentially is uh, like the Netflix of gaming for game streaming. And that will obviously um, uh, uh, in, help us in terms of the mobile gaming space. Uh, in addition to um, 5G coming out, which we call the mobile super cycle, um, about 40% of all phones sold in 2020 were 5G compatible. We're expecting this to um, rise to 60% um, this year. Um, and obviously, um, there's been huge growth in the online space, which we are now um, looking to capitalize on even more so with the launch of Tech Union. And um, we've expanded our audio portfolio in the last um, six months. Um, in, in audio, still the largest electronics category across Australia and New Zealand with a compound annual growth rate of 13% for the next five years. So in terms of the spaces that we operate in across um, turn left distribution and gaming and sell it in um, lifestyle technology and, and mobility accessories, we feel we're um, really well positioned to um, capitalize on growth over the next couple of years. One of the major releases for us in the gaming space is um, from Capcom. Um, it's the new installment of the Resident Evil series, in Res Resident Evil Village. Uh, this uh, launches on the 7th of May and is a AAA title and has been um, highly anticipated. And um, Turn Left Distribution uh, is the exclusive distributor across Australia and New Zealand for, uh, for Capcom. One of the other new exclusive um, offerings we have is our long-term partner, Otterbox, which is the leading um, mobile phone case supplier and a leading um, um, market share in terms of the US market and globally, and also has the um, LifeProof brand uh, um, under its umbrella, is now entering the gaming space. And this is obviously ideal for us uh, in terms of um, a new range of accessories targeted towards um, the mobile gaming space, which is uh, forecasted to grow um, significantly um, over, the, over the coming years, outstripping our PC and console gaming. And, and this um, type of new crossover accessory product um, is uh, expected to do extremely well. Another new brand for us is, is Wave. It's, um, it's our own brand and we're targeting this into the entry to mid-level space. And um, obviously being our own brand, um, we do the end-to-end -end sourcing and um, provides us with the ability to um, deliver um, higher margins and return points. So the, the roadmap for Wave Audio includes um, Bluetooth speakers, um, headphones, etc. Another uh, new um, fashion brand, which is available to us across Australia and New Zealand now is Coach Accessories. These are licensed accessories specific to um, uh, the mobile phone space. Um, so, um, uh, you know, just another a great um, high street fashion brand to add um, to our portfolio. Other new brand partners is um, Zens, which is um, a, um, a leader in uh, wireless charging wireless charging market is uh, forecast to grow 25% um, over the coming years. And um, this brand offers um, consumer and business solutions. Um, we have distribution of Instax from Fujifilm, um, which um, has um, great demand um, in the youth market. And that's um, uh, for the distribution into the, the telco channel. And um, there's a uh, another great range of accessories coming from um, Nikon um, in mobile gaming. And um, that will, again capitalizes on um, on the advent of, of 5G and, and mobile gaming and uh, and uh, Microsoft X, uh, X Cloud gaming. One of the other things we're um, looking to implement in the coming months is investor perks. So outside of um, of uh, traditional um, uh, value, we can um, drive to shareholders. Obviously, we've got a very unique, um, exclusive portfolio. And so for shareholders with a minimum shareholding of 200,000 shares, we're looking at providing access to our, um, our um, uh, B2C commerce portal um, with a code, and that will um, allow for discounted pricing on all gaming audio mobility products up to $1,000 per year. 
for personal use. That's um, that's the end of the um, presentation. Uh, we'll um, we'll now go back to um, Mark for um, for any questions. Uh, thanks very much, Xavier. The questions have been flying in, but I've got a few ahead of time, so I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get to them all, but uh, to be fair to the people who've emailed ahead of time, um, I'm going to kind of tag team between the, the live ones and the, the, head, the ahead of time ones. Um, I, I'm going to start with one of the ahead of time ones, and um, Dave, uh, a lot of uh, people who import have, have said, you know, that COVID-19 has really disrupted supply chain so the question is you know what impact has that had on your supply chains and and stock levels uh, um where do you sit now with like inventory uh, across the across the board yeah it certainly has been a factor you know covid has been a massive disrupt a disruptor to um supply chains globally and um you know we obviously weren't immune to that in terms of being a um a large distributor across australia and new zealand um, we had a number of um, containers that just um, didn't get um, to us in time for Christmas. Um, they have um, since arrived. Um, and, um, you, you know, the, the, these are products uh, that are in high demand, so not too concerning for us, particularly in the gaming space. Um, in terms of the, um, uh, the, the business holistically, I, I think we're in, a, we're in a pretty good space. Um, you, you know, some of the um, upheaval um, has certainly... Um, has slowed down. I think we were impacted not only by, by COVID, but also by um, the strike action at ports and stuff across um, across Australia, which which seemed to have settled for the most part. So um, it, it has been a factor, but I think we've been able to navigate it pretty well and um, um, yeah, I'm not overly concerned with it at this point. Okay, great. And then uh, I think maybe this question lines up nicely with what you just said there. Um, the December result declined compared to November, um, and the question is, you know, what was the driver that was the logistics cost? But it sounds like uh, it was those delayed shipments basically restricting uh, stock on the shelves ahead of Christmas. Is that fair to say? Well, actually, um, yeah, we, we did have some shipments delayed in December, and that was, um, had, you know, impeded the, the ability for us to realise the full potential of the December result. But actually... Traditionally, we do more in November than December because we ship um, you know, into retail early. Um, and our actually, our December result was, was pleasing. It was, was up on prior year um, and, and ahead of budget. And, uh, and I think you know, in terms of that, that half year, the revenue was flat, but we, um, we actually saw a bit of a U-shaped recovery where, where, where our Q1 revenue was down, but our Q2 revenue was up. And it's... Um, and I and I and I think on on balance, our December result was actually you know very pleasing to us. Okay. Another question from ahead of time: um, Where are you on the the cost out program, and should we expect further significant costs out? Or are you at the at the end of that process? No, we we um, we took all the um, the action that we needed to do um, in June um, prior to the start of our our, our financial year. Uh, in terms of um, uh, transforming the business, so um, at this point, I'm, I'm not, you know, uh, planning to do any any further um, cost reduction. It, it's more our focus is now on um, new business development and uh, revenue growth, uh, both organically and by acquisition. Okay, and then uh, what percentage of the sales come from the the own brands uh, versus the third party brands and? Uh, can you give a sense of the kind of margin differential between the two? Yeah, the um, the margins for our own brands um, uh, are, are generally at least ten percent higher than um, than the um, supplier product, and as a percentage of our of our business, um, they generally uh, make up around twenty percent. Okay, great. And then we've got an online one and a ahead of time one around M and A. I'll just go with the the ahead of time one um, where are you looking for acquisitions is it either to gain access to uh, different brands or is it to look into you know different product verticals as kind of the previous two acquisitions have done uh, actually all of them we, we um, uh, we're 
we're pretty open in terms of the space that we're looking at. Obviously, um, um, brand acquisitions is one avenue we can look at. Um, competitive um, or synergistic distribution uh, operations that make sense uh, is another avenue, and, 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 and sales channels as well. So um, we really, um, um, you, you know, have our eyes open in terms of what would be um, what would uh, make sense for us and what would be synergistic and and add. Um, to you know the existing um, vehicle that we've got um, within within Cellnet. Obviously, you know the past two years we've made three um, you know um, significant um, acquisitions, um, and um, and um, it, it remains a focus for us. Okay, and another question around logistics. Um, you know we've seen shipping rates, uh, you know, really spike around um, Corona. Uh, are you seeing, are you also bearing that cost and are you able to kind of pass through any of that increased logistic cost uh, in terms of price increases? We, we are um, seeing those increased costs. Um, I, I think we've, we've also benefited, uh, benefited from um, um, uh, strong currency foreign exchange um, in a lot of the products we buy are in US dollars and um, that, that's certainly been, been, been favourable. So I think you know, some of the increased logistics costs have been offset by um, increased foreign exchange. So at this point in time, uh, we've been um, uh, been able to hold pricing relatively consistent in the market. Um, we haven't had to do um, any um, any major price increases off the back of um, um, spiking logistics costs. Okay. And then a question on, I guess, customer concentration. Um, you know, who are the, the main retailers you work with and the, the top three accounts, you know, how much of, of their sales would account for, um, you know, revenue in, in the cell net business? Sure. Um, in um, Australia, our, um, you know, largest accounts, um, actually, Chris, you want to jump in, you might have a more accurate number just um, in front of you in terms of the splits and, and percentages. Yeah, just, just looking at, at the different sort of business segments, we've got the Australian distribution business. Um, the main customers there are Optus um, and JB Hi-Fi. Uh, they're our biggest accounts. Together, they, they make up around 38% around, uh, of the Australian business. In New Zealand, um, the, the distribution business in New Zealand, the main customers there are Spark, which is the largest telco provider in New Zealand, and Nolleaming. Uh, together, those two customers make up about 63% of the New Zealand business. And then in the gaming business, uh, Turnlift Distribution, uh, which operates um, solely in Australia, um, the two biggest customers there are JB Hi-Fi and EB Games. Uh, and together, those two customers equate or make up about 83% of the, the gaming business. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I, I mean, uh, Mark, probably not surprising, you know, the largest retailer in consumer electronics in Australia is JB Hi-Fi in New Zealand. It's Noel Lemming, uh, and then the you know the you know large telcos, the likes of Spark and Optus, etc. So um, that's traditionally where where our, our revenue falls. Yeah, and then uh, this is a good one, I think, for people who might be new to the story. Um, I don't think we're going to get to all these questions, but uh, uh, WeTronics, um, your German shareholder, you know, what's their background? When did they acquire the? The shareholding and selling it then you know have they expressed an, an intention about what their you know long-term plans are they uh, wintronic um came on board i think around uh, 2017 um their expertise is in um online um, distribution uh, in it accessories and in fact one of their brands is in our portfolio now and we're um, expanding that across australia and new zealand um so they have a subsidiary, Wintronic Asia Pacific, um, which provides our, um, our sourcing um, out, out of um, um, the, um, Southeast Asia, and, and it provides obviously a, a benefit there. Um, at, you know, at this at this point, they um, um, they are comfortable and um, and, um, and and um, they see um, obviously synergistic benefits for um, for their their operation um, in terms of. Um, you know, not only idea sharing, but also expansion of brands, etc. Okay. 
Um, Chris, Dave, we're going to have to leave it there uh, because I want to um, stay on time and uh, you know get our, our next presenter up and running because I can see they're waiting in the wings. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. And just quickly, if anybody wants to get in touch with uh, yourself or Chris to find out more about the, the Selnet story, what's the best way to get in touch? Uh, we've got an uh, email address that we have set up uh, for investor relations. It's ir at cellnet.com.au. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Dave. Uh, and now I'm going to pass over to uh, Grant Hackett. Uh, Grant, if you want to start sharing your screen, um, no, we'll, we'll, we'll get into it. that now. Can you, can you see that? I can see the cover slide of your presentation now, Grant. You're, you're good to go. Brilliant. We'll kick off. Thank you very much, Mark. Much appreciated. Good morning to everyone. Uh, firstly, very happy to be here today to presenting a little bit about Generation Development Group and our business and, and more specifically a lot around the life company today because that's been in existence for about 17 years with this group. Um, I'm Grant Haggett, the CEO of Generation Development Group and Generation Life. And I've got Terence Wong joining me the, this morning, who's the Chief Financial Officer of the group. Okay, so just a little bit about us. I'll just try and get through the next slide. Here we go. So Generation Development Group, um, you can see there the ASX ticker, GDG. Uh, we're a licensed pool development fund, a PDF. Um, that delivers tax-free capital gains and tax-exempt dividends. Now, not too many people understand or appreciate what a PDF is. Um, it's something that the government gave out 20 years ago to a lot of uh, growth industries and financial services, biotech, mining, energy and resources, etc. Um, it, and it's still something that we've retained today. There's a few restrictions that we have to operate within the PDF, but it's very good from a shareholder point of view, as you can see the tax concessions that you receive. Um, we're always looking at investing in rapidly growing segments of the financial services industry and anything that has regulatory tailwinds, particularly since the, the changes to the industry post Royal Commission. And you can see on the left hand side there, the brands that operate uh, under Generation Development Group. Um, so why Generation Development Group? Um, over the past few years, you can see that we've been very consistent on our performance. You can see sales growth, CAGR of 20 plus percent um, over the past four or five years and 23% um, on FUM growth. Uh, we sit at over 1.5 billion today on our main platform. Um, we've had consistent and very strong NPAT growth. And you can see there for the half, we did 53% increase on underlying NPAT, um, which was well above expectations. Um, one of the things we love about this business is how sticky uh, the fund is on our platform. So for every dollar that comes onto the platform, it has an average maturity profile of 13.9 years. And of that $1.5 billion, just to give a a broad view of um, you know the business over the past few years and some of the changes that have taken place in the first 13 13 and a half years of the business just over a billion dollars worth of investment bonds were written now over the last three and a half years since rob coombe who's our non-executive chairman of the group came in and really re-engineered this space particularly when the changes around superannuation took place and made this structure very very attractive again we've written about 1.1 billion business a billion dollars worth of business over that time frame. So you can see we've really accelerated, but that means that the maturity profile is right at the beginning of that curve in terms of that fund. So it's a, it's a real annuity style business. Um, we've had a real track record over the past year, few years of product innovation. Um, we're going to talk about those in a few slides just around the tax aware series, the equity income fund, um, and also the annuity product that we see as a transformational opportunity for the group. Um, I've already touched on the, the PDF there. We're a capital business model. So um, obviously the live company is regulated by APRA and we only need a small amount of operational capital, which is 25 basis points of our overall FUM. Um, and we also have an internal buffer for our risk management of 15 basis points. Uh, we have a very positive outlook on, on sales. We've had a very good start to this year. And if you look at FY20, we have 50% increase in sales with a record year that year. Um, we're also very confident that we can produce another record year in FY21 and we feel like we're very, very well positioned for the future growth uh, in the financial services sector. Okay, just to, I've only got 20 minutes here today plus 10 minutes worth of questions, so I won't go through line by line just here on the headline financial summary. 
Uh, but you can see there, revenue is up 26%, underlying um, end pad of the life business up 45% on prior corresponding period. Um, income from associates, we did a, a capital raise where we bought 37% of Lonsec in September. So you can see there the pro rata amount of revenue that was derived from that investment. Um, and you can see there the underlying profit, which includes the income from associates is up 53% uh, year on year. Um, you can see uh, dividend uh, per share and FUM uh, there and the growth of 21% across there and just the cash balances uh, within the business. A very clean business. Uh, we like to think it's very, very well run. Um, no debt in there, plenty of cash on the balance sheet and certainly um, you know, meeting all the, the capital requirements from an APRA point of view. Um, some of the key performance measures, um, again, I won't go through all of these line by line. I'll just pull out a couple that I think are quite significant and as CEO that I really focus on to drive the business. Um, the first one is obviously live product sales. It's pretty much flat um, year on year, 166 million uh, of PCP there. Um, the, the delta really in that is we received a $13.8 million deal for uh, an estate planning requirement um, the previous year. So that's really the delta in that. And also um, one of the things to recognize with our business is the fact that 75 or 80% of our staff reside within Melbourne. So our number one and number two BDMs um, reside within Melbourne as well. So being in lockdown for the first four, four and a half months um, of this financial year uh, was particularly challenging. Um, we certainly found innovative ways to be able to deliver better results and continue to to move forward and, and you know, develop new products um, and drive the sales team, but it was challenging. We're starting to see um, a material difference now in terms of um, activity um, and results from a sales point of view now that we're opening back up and those restrictions have eased quite a bit. Um, you can see there we're taking close to 40% um, market share. We're on a lot of approved product lists uh, with the various dealer groups, which is obviously our main distribution channel. So about 90 to 92% to of our inflows come through the intermediary channel or through financial advisors. So we very much focus on that space, not the direct space. We're the only investment bond provider that's highly recommended from both Zenith and Lonsec. And we've had that uh, for 12 years now with Zenith. Um, and this is a real key metric that I focus on is active financial advisors. Um, so when we, come, when we came into the business uh, a few years ago, that number was 451. Now, just to uh, provide you with a definition of what an active financial advisor is, that means they've written one or more bonds on a 12 month rolling average. So it is a real time number. So um, at the end of FY20, that number finished at 1205. And you can see there over that six month period, even though a lot of the team uh, was in a lockdown uh, in Melbourne, uh, it's still gone up 22% uh, uh, on the prior corresponding period to finish at 1325. Um, one of the big numbers um, that's been very, very encouraging and really puts us in a good position for the second half of this financial year is new bond numbers. Uh, seeing that up 54% is quite incredible. So we've done a lot of investment in uh, back office and operations just to automate a lot of the processes that we have there. Because you know, if you look at this you know, three or four years ago, we used to do 2,266 applications in a year. Now we're doing 6,570. So you can just see how much more popular uh, the bond is today. Um, and we've got 50 investment options on the menu. Savings plan is up 61%, um, about you know, 10 to 15% of all new bonds attached to savings plan. So that continues to rise year in, year out. So this is just a brief overview of the industry. Um, what you really want to see on this slide is the greatest disparity between the bar chart and the line graph there. Um, you can see there generation life were number one in inflows taking close to, to 40%. Um, AU uh, just next to us there, you can see on the line chart that they've got the majority of market share, um, but don't quite achieve their, their natural market share. Um, where you can see with us, um, where we're absolutely smashing the lights out in terms of that disparity between um, what our overarching market share is versus um, what we receive in total inflows. Uh, you can see some of our other competitors there, such as Futurity, IWF and Century Capital. Century, most people see that as a property business, but it does have a, a, a life insurance arm and they distribute uh, an investment bond. All these businesses are the, the main competitors and, and, and have all invested quite seriously um, into this space, but you can see there that we're the, the dominant player. 
just to give, like, I guess, the growth story over the, the past few years. So you can see um, on the left hand side there, this is just the, the closing funds under management. Um, you can see there in calendar year 16, it was 685 million. Uh, that's well over a double today. In calendar year 20, it's finished close to 1.5 billion and continues to, to grow um, on that trajectory. On the right hand side there, you can see annual sales and net inflows. And, and year on year, we continue to, to prove ourselves there and, and certainly to capture more market share and grow the overall industry. So the first year we came in, which was that FY18 year, we jumped up 72% from 133 million up to 228 million. Kind of plateaued for, for the following year, continue to do more innovation. So a massive increase in FY20 of 50% on our overall sales. And uh, this year, we feel very confident that we'll be able to get another record year in sales. Some recent uh, initiatives, so some of our product innovations that give us the, the competitive advantage, um, obviously over the competition. Um, and, and one of the things that we, we did more recently in terms of the capital raise and some of the, uh, I guess, investments that we're looking at financial services. Um, so this is a long second, this is just a quick overview of them, but um, the reason that we went into, I, I guess, this business and the reason that we did this investment I guess there's probably three or four key things or key attributes that we're looking at um, in terms of you know, businesses and financial services that we want to invest in. So one is that we want to see reoccurring revenue. So we want to see that annuity uh, stream coming through like the life business. Um, the second part is we want to see a, a sharp growth aspect to, to the business where we can really capitalize on a particular area of that business that we see an opportunity of financial services. We like to see high barriers to entry as well. Um, which certainly with the life business, it's very difficult to get a life license. And in fact, Apple probably said about six months ago that they're not providing any more life licenses for the next two years. So um, certainly high barriers seem to be on the life business. And being a research business mindset, um, there's high barriers to, to this business as well. And probably the last part that we really consider, does it have regulatory tailwinds? Uh, the life company certainly does because you know, the changes to superannuation in the life business, the investment bond being the most tax effective solution outside of superannuation and also being the most flexible investment structure full stop. So that's very much got the regulatory tailwinds that we like to see. And so does this business being an independent research house. Um, and it's got four key areas to it. One, it's got research where it researches financial products. Um, the next part, which is really the turbocharge of growth that we see is the biggest opportunity, which is the one sec investment solution, which is the managed account space, and there's a huge growth space within financial services. There's also the super ratings place. We didn't place too much value on that particular part of the business because there's a lot of consolidation taking place within super right now. And then there's the IRAC software, which um, almost 5,000 uh, financial advisors use through Lonsec to provide analytical tools and look at portfolio construction for their, their underlying clients. Um, the real recurring revenues on the research side, the real growth opportunity in this business is one second investment solutions or the managed account space. Um, when we did the DD um, on this particular business and when we went around doing the capital raise, there was 659 million uh, sitting in the managed accounts um, FUM as of 30 June 2020. Um, and we said, look, we predict this to grow at 5% per month, which would have been an outstanding result. It ended up finishing the calendar year at 1.27 billion. So it actually grew much faster than that. So in terms of, I guess, the expectation that we created with this investment, um, it's achieved well above that. And as we look more into the group, um, we're seeing even further opportunities to, to improve the business and see the business grow. Um, it's a very, very clean business, much like the, the life company and GDG. It's got no debt. It's got about $10 million sitting there in cash. It's also got a $10 million debt facility you can draw on if we see any acquisition opportunities, specifically in the managed account spaces where we'd be looking for something like that, just to, again, uh, accelerate the growth within this uh, particular asset. Um, just to, yeah, I guess, provide a bar chart on, on just what I alluded to um, on the previous slide, you can see there that the growth um, in Lonsec Investment Solutions, and you can see when we actually made the investment there, uh, we did the capital raise in September, made the investment there in October where it just hit the billion dollar mark, which is obviously a pretty uh, key threshold to, to be able to hit. And it's really continued to accelerate and it's also continued to accelerate coming into the calendar year as well. Okay, some of the product innovations that we're doing within the live company at the moment that are super exciting and 
really provide a very strong value proposition to our financial advisors and their underlying investors and clients. Um, first on the left hand side there, you can see we launched the Generation Life Tax Aware Series, which we did in the first half of FY21. Very, very excited about this because the investment bond traditionally, just to give you the, the 30 second overview, is a max tax rate of 30%. So there's a tax arbitrage for anyone who's on over 30 cents of the dollar. So it's a great um, investment for people like that, particularly for people who are looking to have a tax effective vehicle outside their super. Um, and it's an after tax paying product. Um, what we've done with the tax enhanced and tax optimized areas is a lot of the, those 50 investment options that you see now, we've transitioned those over from a unitized structure over to a mandate structure. So of course, when you're starting at a headline tax rate of 30%, um, you know, you've got your franking that you can add back, which brings your effective tax rate down to that 23 or 24% range. Um, but because we've transitioned over to mandate, so we're able to hold our, our assets outside of the unitized structure, say a Magellan or a Vanguard, some of the you know, biggest fund managers in this country, um, we're able to do the capital management and maximize the, the existing tax rules within the investment bond structure. So a, a key attribute of that um, which most people wouldn't appreciate is we can do things like offset a capital loss against income. And obviously that creates a significant arbitrage. So that brings that effective tax rate down to that I just articulated of 23 or 24% down to about 15 or 16%. So we're starting to really compete with the headline uh, rate of superannuation there. So that's very, very exciting. You can see the increased return because of that tax alpha that we call is anywhere from 40 basis points to up to 290 basis points uh, per annum. So there's obviously a lot less risk compared to investment risk around that because that's tax alpha that you know you can drive, you know you can deliver like you can around your franking credits. On the right hand side there, also another product that we launched just before Christmas for the wholesale market is a generation life equity income fund. Now over the last couple of years, we've really looked at the tax rules, the tax structure, and we thought, how can we actually follow the thematic just in the market where people are continually chasing yield but willing to go up on the risk spectrum because the traditional products where they would get yield from such as your fixed interest um, or your TDs even when they were sitting at four or five percent, you just don't make the money that you used to um, on those particular products. Um, so what we decided to do was utilize our tax structure to bring down the overall tax rate for an investor um, and, and obviously increase their after-tax re returns quite materially. So effectively that tax alpha is able to increase their yield versus increasing their investment risk. So this is one of many we hope to launch in this particular space around the income series that we're talking about. And this pays an effective tax rate for someone who's on the highest marginal tax rate of 47% of around 8%. So if you're achieving, this fund has been around for, for 10 years. It's just the first time that we put this uh, the investment bond tax effective wrapper around it, you could say. Um, so we've done all the back testing with the actuarial team at Deloitte's to uh, independently verify all the figures. But if you were to get the, the average of around the 6% return that this fund provides in terms of the, in terms of the yield, um, your after tax return through our structure would sit at around 5.7 or 5.8%. So um, that's what you get to put in your pocket. Um, if you were to do it directly, um, your after-tax return would be around 4.3 or 4.2% as a high-paying tax individual. So you can see the tax arbitrage that is created there through this particular structure is quite significant. Now, moving on to the next product innovation that we've got coming out towards the end of this calendar year, which we're super excited about. We see this as very transformational in the businesses. One of the key challenges really for uh, Australians and obviously the baby boomer population all um, going into retirement now is longevity risk and outliving their savings and how worried people are and, and how concerned they are about spending um, their, their account-based pension up front um, when they're in their, their kind of best years of retirement, we could say, where they can travel, where they can, you know, they're still young enough to be able to go out there and spend money and do things, but they're very, very conservative because they're worried that they might outlive their savings. Um, so we've created the, the first investment linked lifetime annuity that will have multiple investment options for a financial advisor or for an investor to be able to choose from. So there's kind of three key attributes around this. One, um, it allows you through the means testing to be able to access more age pension and all the additional benefits such as your Commonwealth Seniors Healthcare Card, et cetera, and all the concessions that come around that. It guarantees income for life. So you know you're going to receive this income along with your age pension and your allocated pension, if that's still around and you haven't spent it all, for life, um, it's going to be able to generate an additional 20 to 30% return 
in comparison to traditional lifetime annuities that you see at the marketplace um, right now. So it's a very, very compelling um, product proposition. And the interesting thing about this is that it's such a significant growth space. Um, so you know, if you look at the amount of assets that sit in the post-retirement assets pool right now, it's about 566 billion, but that's going to grow to about 1.2 trillion in 10 years' time. So it's certainly a space as a business, as a life company, we want to be playing within. So you can see here, just on the right-hand side, I'm not going to cover the left-hand side because I'm pretty much running out of time. But you've got your account-based pension, you've got your age pension, then you've got your lifetime annuity to give you that guarantee, to give you that reassurance in retirement that you're going to receive income for life. And also it's going to help you access the age pension, which means you're probably going to slow down spending the, the income generated or some of the capital out of your account-based pension also. What this um, slide represents is just how much in terms of assets year on year is moving into the post-retirement uh, space. So you can see there, 2020, it's at around uh, 25 billion. You can see that's quadrupling in 2028 to 100 billion, and doubling again by 2035. Um, so we really want to play in this growth uh, area. And this market where you would have seen in the retirement income review that the government released, um, that people you know, need more options in retirement to be able to produce income and to make sure that they can mitigate longevity risks. Um, these are some of the assumptions that we've made um, in terms of what we see around um, the opportunity for our particular products. If we were just to take 2% of market share in 2024, you can see there that would equate to $1 billion worth of additional inflows. Um, you can see that because of the massive growth rate in the space, if we were to increase that in 2029 to 4.5%, which is a very, very realistic number, it would be as much as $5 billion. So this is the new opportunity. So this is not the existing market. This is the new opportunity that has been created every single year in the post-retirement pool. Um, just a quick outlook, and this is the last slide, and then I'll hand it back to Mark just to facilitate some questions. Um, so we, we expect to exceed the FY20 number where we were 50% increase in our, our inflows. Um, we've been able to successfully do all the product launches that we promised to the market when we did our full year results, specifically the equity income fund um, and the tax aware series, which has been able to decrease the effective tax rate for our investors. Um, we've got the product development on the lifetime annuity um, achieving all the key milestones. So we intend on launching that to the market in October, subject to APRA approval, but so far we've had very good engagement with them. And we're always open to new investment opportunities that are complementary to our existing businesses, or like I said very long, fit that criteria around those three or four key things that we're looking at and are well positioned for future growth in the financial services sector. Uh, thanks very much for everybody's time this morning, much appreciated. I hope you've learned a little bit about our group if you want to know more specifics, um, please contact our, contact our CFO, Terence Wong. You can see his information on the screen there. And uh, yeah, look forward to presenting in a few more forums like this. And thanks again for your time. Mark, back to you. Uh, thanks, Grant. Yeah, we've got quite a few questions again, a bit like our last presenter, some ahead of time and some that have come in now. So I'm going to alternate between the two to try and be fair in the, in the time that we've got. Um, I'll just kick off with one that came in ahead of time. Um, Capital management policy grant, uh, what is it given, you know, you've got, uh, you know, a strong desire to grow, but at the same time, I guess you want to re reward shareholders as you kind of move along in this journey. Yeah, so we've been, we're in a very fortunate position now. So just to give a bit of a, I guess, the, the prescript to all of that, um, you know, the, the business was kind of incrementally growing, so growing very, very slowly. And they used to pay dividends um, out of capital. Uh, because there's a fair bit of capital sitting on the balance sheet. Now we're in the fortunate position where we're at scale, we've got that operational leverage where we're able to continue to pay dividends, but not out of capital anymore, but out of underlying earnings. And we're also got enough discretionary expenditure now where we continue to do product development. So you can see there, we took on a very ambitious schedule with the three key products that we're developing. And they cost anywhere from sort of 500,000 on the lower side for the annuity product, which is up to 10 million including the, the capital requirements from an APRA point of view. So we feel like we're well positioned to be able to keep that growth where you saw that pay, those PAYGAR numbers of 20 to 30% uh, per year. We're able to pay a dividend out of underlying earnings and we're able to really reinvest back in the business to be able to get that future growth and also um, play 
in you know those those pockets such as the post retirement asset space where we see real opportunities to transform the company. Great. And then we've got a, a question and let's stay on capital for a second because we've got kind of a, a question uh, ahead of time and one that's come in that kind of neatly goes together. Uh, the cash that sits on the accounts, the 80 million, um, how is that broken up between regulatory capital that's, let's say, re restricted and, you know, what's kind of free cash flow for your own uses? Uh, so the, the way it works on that 80 million, so you're looking at the stat accounts there, so it's quite confusing. So ASIC make us combine the policyholder or the investor cash account with our own cash account. So our cash balance actually sits at 30 million and the other 50 million, which I know is confusing, is actually, actually investors' money. So if you just look at the headline numbers, that gives you a better and more accurate and transparent summation in terms of what's sitting on our balance sheet. In terms of why the cash balance is so high at the moment, there's a bit of a timing issue. The ATO gave us an extra uh, couple of months to, to pay uh, what we normally pay about seven or $8 million in December, um, which happened in February. So if you sort of take that on, our, our cash balance sits at about 22 or 23 million. In terms of our current uh, regulatory capital requirements, that sits at about four to, to $5 million. Um, and, and as our inflows have been quite good because it works on a certain formula, It'll probably be about six million dollars that's required there. So you can see really above and beyond that, and that includes our own internal buffer model out of the 15 basis points. Above and beyond that, we probably have free cash of anywhere just from sort of 10 to, to 15 million. And we've got, yeah, uh, and also, yeah, there's obviously a, a significant amount of uh, capital that's going to go into the annuities uh, product, which will be about a five million dollar expenditure by the time we get to um, the end of this calendar year. Okay, great, thanks for that. Um, and then maybe if we just backtrack a, a small bit, um, a question around the investment in Lonsec and why you didn't just go to 100%, uh, you know, what was the, the thinking around taking the, I guess, kind of large minority stake in the business? It's a, it's a very good question. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for it. Uh, one, the 37% stake was all that was available, but it actually worked quite well for our business because um, I said at the outset of the presentation that we had that thing called the Pool Development Fund License, the PDF, um, and there's certain requirements that you have to play within. So in terms of um, acquisitions, uh, we can only spend a, a certain amount, there's a certain threshold um, that we have to play within. And at that particular point in time, uh, it was about 25 million that we, we could actually spend on an acquisition, which meant that 37% on the valuation that we have for Lonsec fit perfectly within that. So we weren't able to break that and we were still able to, to do the acquisition and retain the PDF, which is obviously great for, for shareholders from a tax point of view. Um, over time, we would love to acquire more of that business um, as we grow. And there will be a certain point in time where the PDF won't service anymore. It'll actually be too restricted for growth. Um, but we wanna make sure that the, the share price is in a good position and we see fair value of that before we hand that back to the government. So um, there's a few reasons uh, for that 37% stake, but we certainly um, do have hopes. Uh, and, and look, we don't have necessary timeframes on that, but we do have hopes to be able to, to, pay, to ascertain a controlling stake. Okay, great. And then uh, if we can just another question, this around the growth in the, the APLs and the, and the active advisors, you know, what's the realistic addressable market in terms of that for the investment bond business, um, you know, in terms of, you know, dealing with the Count Plus guys or the Sequoia guys, um, you know, wh wh how much room for growth is still left there in that do you feel? Uh, we still see plenty of opportunity for growth because we're really just tapping into to the tax rules and the structure. So there's a lot of products that we can bring out that are, are going to not just really play in the investment bond space, but more broadly in the unit trust uh, market, which is an $800 billion pool. So much, much bigger than the investment bond. In terms of um, APL coverage, look, we don't need too many more, uh, I guess, uh, to be on too many more APLs to be able to continue to get that growth. Being on 455 is, is quite significant for, for a product. Um, we're very, very fortunate that we're the only ones in the investment bond industry that have highly recommended from both Zenith and Lonsec and conscious that our Lonsec rating was um, there well and truly before we actually uh, bought that asset. Um, but certainly uh, for, for us, we want to continue to um, watch 
how the dislocation of financial services plays out. One thing we're really conscious of, it really went from what I call the dealer groups, where of course all the financial practices sit, um, went from the big six or the big four banks, the AMP, IOOF, down to what I was calling kind of your mid size 30 or mid size, mid size 40. So we were very, very conscious um, during and post the World Commission um, that we stayed very, very close to all the individual practices that we do business with. When advisors were leaving those banking channels and they went off to, um, you know, obviously smaller practices or became self licensed. So um, we did that very, very well and very comprehensively. Um, and we continue to see an increase in, in APLs just because of that dissipation going on in the industry and the fact that so many people were coming out of those you know, larger institutions down to, to their own groups or into smaller dealer groups. But that will continue to play out and we'll continue to stay very, very close to that. Okay, great, Grant, we still have a few more questions. Have you got five minutes to maybe tackle another one or two? Yeah, sure, more than happy. Yeah. Oh, great, thank you. Um, on the annuity product that's going to launch, um, maybe if you want to just flick back to that slide, you know, what's the, going to be the key difference between yours and um, I guess what Challenger currently has in the market? Or is it kind of a very similar product, but you're kind of saying, you know, Challenger, you can't have this market all to yourself? Yeah, so Challenger, you know, they, they've kind of owned 90% of the traditional lifetime and equity products. So, um, firstly, I guess I'll just touch on what are the things that are the same. Um, firstly, the one thing that's the same is that it guarantees income for life. So that that's um, absolutely key. Um, and the, the other aspect um, that is the same is that it allows you to access more of your age pension uh, benefits. So they're the two things that are the same. What is different about um, this product in comparison to the Challenger Lifetime Annuity? is the fact that this is investment linked. So a lot of their products are either CPI linked or interest rate linked, where this is investment linked. And we all know with investment markets compared to those types of products, the returns are significantly better. Also, the other key uh, point of difference for this particular product is the fact that you'll be able to change around your investment strategy. So if you no longer want to sit in a diversified strategy, you want to go more to a balanced strategy, you can do that or you can split the strategy. So one of the, the key attributes of this is the fact that the financial advisors will very much stay involved with their clients for the life of this product versus doing just a one-off or a set and forget. So um, the value of this that it will provide in terms of the additional income because it's investment linked is quite a material difference. And the other aspect is if they think that the you know, macro environment is changing and they want to change their investment strategy, they have the option um, to be able to do that as well. Okay, great. And then uh, another question ahead of time. Um, you know, the, uh, you, you slightly referenced it in the presentation. Um, Centuria's uh, life business, I mean, it would seem pretty non core to, you know, their overall business. And the question is, is, would that be a better fit uh, within uh, GDG? That's a, it's a good question. Um, we'd, we'd love to be able to. Um, you know, buy additional bond books. Uh, I think the biggest problem when you talk about the, the century one, which we've got up on the slide here now, is um, I think that's a bit of a poison pill. Uh, if someone was to try and do an acquisition of that group because of the property business, um, that the life bonuses would be an inhibitor to, to some of that. So um, I don't know all the particulars of that, but um, I know that would certainly come into play and would probably be an unattractive proposition for them if we were to, to purchase that and take away that license from, the, from that particular group. Look, the logical one that kind of sits there that I see amongst all of the, the key competitors here is the IWF one. Um, I think that's got a, a similar maturity profile. I think it's got a similar client base. Obviously, we'd have to do DD on, on all of that to make sure it's a, it's a fit. Um, and because we're doing well over 300 million worth of inflows now, where if you go back three or four years, we were doing just over 100 million. We've actually got to look for a book that's got you know, plenty of synergy within it, but is at scale as well. So, you know, when we were kind of sitting at 700 mil just a few years ago, a book of 100 or 200 mil would have been quite material where now we can just do that a few, within a few months of our own inflows. So it would really have to be a book that's probably 500 million plus um, for us to even consider an, an, an acquisition given the organic growth that we're able to, to generate just from ourselves. 
Okay, great. Uh, Grant, I'm not going to take up any more of your time. I'm going to, we've already stolen an extra five minutes. Thank you uh, so much for the presentation and for, for answering all the questions. And uh, yeah, you, um, Terence's details are up there if anybody wants to get in touch um, after the fact. No worries. Thanks very much, Mark. And uh, thanks to all the investors for listening. Cheers. Thanks, Grant. Thanks, Terence. Okay, thanks, everyone. Um, I'll be in touch on social media. Uh, through the emails about our next event, which will hopefully be next week.